hopefully it won't be so noisy. So this is Larry West with the organization Restore the Fourth. So why are we here today, Larry? We're here today because of Stop and Frisk. And Stop and Frisk, we as Restore the Fourth believe, is an unconstitutional abuse of power. We think it unfairly targets people, and more importantly, it violates the Fourth Amendment. It means there you are walking the street or just mind your own business waiting for a bus. You can be stopped for any reason because you look suspicious and then have your rights violated by having a pat down and being frisked. Okay. It's an, we feel it's an unlawful detainment. Okay, let's go over the, the Fourth Amendment is, is what? The Fourth so Amendment is the, is the ability and the right to be securing your persons and personal effects. And that the only way the police are really allowed to search you is with probable cause and, or with a warrant. Okay. And stop That's and frisk violates both. Has there been targeting of minorities or racial profiling involved uh, in stop and frisk? According to the ACLU 2012 study, unfortunately, yes. It has disproportionately targeted blacks and Hispanics in Philadelphia and Asians. And in the 5th District, which is Daryl Clark's district, and also predominantly white district, there have basically been no stop and frisk. So I've got a story for us that should give us all hope. It's uh, not exactly uh, a, a victim, but a perpetrator. Uh, there's a New Hampshire police officer named Bradley Jardis who did the right thing when he realized that he was perpetrating this crime onto people who hadn't hurt anybody. Uh, he was making criminals out of peaceful people by stopping them on the street uh, and shaking them down essentially for money and, and uh, looking for drugs. This is only harming people and it's not a way to serve or protect the public. And he knew that in his heart. And so being a police officer and taking this job to serve the people, he did the right thing and, and quit. He said he, he couldn't participate in that system anymore because he was the system was turning him into a criminal, it was turning him into a gang member who was shaking down the public for victimless crimes and it has to stop and it stops when people take personal responsibility for their actions and say I'm not going to participate in this anymore. Uh, so it's a story that can give us all hope because police officers all around the country are seeing this happen. They're not blind and they will do the right thing. You just need uh, peaceful people like us to uh, approach them and discuss these issues. So thanks, thanks. It gives me a lot of hope to see everyone here. Back in uh, 1979, back in 1979 when I was in Texas, I walked out of a bar. I was putting my jacket on and there was a cop in the parking lot. He walks right up to me and puts his hands in between mine. He says, what are you doing there? What are you hiding? What? I'm not doing anything. I get in my car. It was a nice, uh, it was a beautiful 69 Camaro all souped up. I tried to drive it and now the clutch is messed up. I couldn't go more than 20 miles an hour. I wonder how that happened. I can't prove it. I think the cops did it. Lo and behold, I drive down the road and there's a checkpoint and they're stopping cars. Now why is this significant? Because in 1979, checkpoints had been declared unconstitutional. This was before the 1996 decision which legalized them. And these Texas cops were stopping everybody driving by. So we talk about rules for the police, do we? They don't care. We can write all the rules we want as long as we have police, and those police are, by the way, the standing army that the founders warned us not to have. As long as we have them in power, they're going to do things to us, like stop and frisk. The founders were clear. You cannot trust power to anyone. They will abuse it. 